I think we're at that point in America now. That's why I say it's, it's an existential crisis. If we don't use everything we have now, we're guaranteed to lose. We, we need to be, we need to use everything we have and we need every Christian. But before we get into our conversation, my name is Eric Metaxas and this channel exists to bring you a biblical perspective on today's news, culture, and hot button issues. If you're new here or not, welcome and be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you are notified when new videos get posted. You wanted to ask me questions about my new book, I Religionless did. Christianity, wow. or people have submitted questions, yeah. and you've been elected to read the questions I to have. me? I have, yes, okay, I I'm, have. I'm nervous, but let's, get, let's do it. Well, Here we you go. You think you're nervous. This is a great book, by the way, Religionless Christianity, God's Answer to Evil. And there's another part of the front of the book that I think is absolutely spot on. It says, there is only one hope left to save America and the world, active, robust, and public faith in God. And I think most people out there that listen to the show and other shows like it will have to agree because things have gotten so far off the rails that, uh, you know, we're now in the ocean somewhere. Well, but not, not everybody would agree, and that's why I wrote a letter to the American church and why I wrote this book. I'm trying to make the biblical case yeah. so that people would would consider it, because not every people are on this page. But yeah. anyway, so somebody submit, who has submitted these questions you're going to ask they're me? Just from, they're just from all over. So general questions, a lot of them come in like, you know, people ask the same questions over and over again. So I can say like, Bob, Mary, Jane, and Bill, Yeah, they all ask this question. Okay. In fact, let me start with the first question. Okay. And this is a general one to all authors, but what sparked you and your interest in writing this book? Uh... I needed the bread, man, you know, the rent's due, and uh, I had to come up with something. It's all about this, money. Yeah, well, no, clearly, uh, we hope that's not the case. We hope that no. I wrote it because God put it on my heart, which, you know what it is? Actually, Letter to the American Church, mm -hmm. um, that book, I know God called me to write that in a way that I had never experienced anything before. Like, I, I, I knew I had to write that book, and the response to it has been so extraordinary, frankly, very surprising to me, uh, that, you know, the publisher was saying, well, do you have more you want to say on this? And I thought, well, yes, actually quite a bit. And so the Letter of the American Church is my shortest book. This is almost as short, but there's some, there's some very important things in terms of, you know, when people say, okay, so I'm supposed to live out, I mean, if you agree with the premise of Letter to the American Church, I'm supposed to live out my faith I'm not supposed to be merely religious as a Christian. How do, what does that look like? Well, religionless Christianity uh, means to be the answer to that question. What does it look like to live to actually live out your faith in a way that's not merely religious in the negative sense of religion? And I don't know, should I answer the question about the title now, or is that one of the well, questions? Well, that's the next question oh. from Mary, Bob, Jill, and Peter. Can you define religiousless Christianity? Why is it God's answer to evil? Well, uh, obviously I write, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but, I, but I'm, I'm happy to say that I do write about all of this in the book, about the, the title, the meaning of the phrase. Religionless Christianity is a Bonhoeffer phrase. Mm. Um, Bonhoeffer was writing to his best friend, Eberhard Beitke. I met Eberhard Beitke's uh, widow in Germany in 2008, uh, Eberhard Beke was, was Bonhoeffer's closest friend, and he was intellectually brilliant uh, as Bonhoeffer was brilliant. And in a letter right at the end of his life, Bonhoeffer's in prison, I believe he's in the Gestapo prison, which was a dark place, uh, figuratively and literally. And he wrote a letter to his best friend in which he was asking now in 1944, how did we get where we are that we've we've sort of lost the battle? The church did not live out its faith. And he says, if only we had had a religion-less Christianity. And he's using religion in the pejorative term that Bart, Karl Bart would have used it, that religion as just dead religiosity, just playing church. And Bonhoeffer says, what we ought to have had was a religionless Christianity. In other words, instead of going through the motions, you know, the Pharisees went through the motions in the yeah. temple. Uh, a lot of Christians go through the motions on Sunday morning. He was saying, instead of just doing that, what if we had actually lived out our faith in a heroic way as though we actually believed it. We would have stood against the evil, but we the German church didn't do that. And I thought, I need to explain what is 
religion apart from real faith, what does that look like? What are some religious idols that that Christians worship thinking that they are being Christians, but actually it's, these are just religious idols? And in the book, I lay out some of these religious idols where you, they're really substitutes for actually worshiping Jesus with our, 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 our whole being. Um, and so I, I kind of lay that out. And because it's an example of how Christians have been fooled in the past. And the story of Bonhoeffer, it's the classic case of he was trying to wake up Christians to be to stop being merely religious and to be actually uh, faithful in, in, in every sphere, willing to stand bravely against the Nazis. And they were thinking, no, 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 we just want to do church. We just want to have our little religious services. We don't believe we need, it's our job to get into that. So in the book, I kind of, I try to unpack what these religious idols are and and how we might be guilty of, of worshiping them rather than worshiping Jesus. Yeah, because it seems like a lot of churches now have leaned toward becoming more like social clubs. Come on in, we're going to celebrate this this activity and that activity, and we're going to have a bake sale, and we're going to, you know, and then they have their flags out there that don't say, you know, we believe in Jesus. It's like, we believe in what the culture's doing, we're going to follow that. And so where did the religion go? Well, there's, there's a lot of that. I mean, that's really the darkest side. But, but to me, it's even churches that wouldn't go there, but neither are there being heroic in the battle for God's well, purposes. You know, that per- leads me back to the one of the most dramatic examples you put in letter to the American church about that, what was it, 18,000 churches? That yeah. Were, yes. That, could you explain that again? Because yeah. that is really powerful. I don't know if you redo it here in this No, I, I, I don't, but it, but it's in the letter to the American church. And in, in a sense, letter to the American church, you need to read that first, I yeah. would say, because it kind of tees up what I say in this book. But the bottom line was that in Germany, in the, in the early 30s, there were about 18,000 Lutheran pastors in Germany. By 1935, two years into the Hitler regime, only 3,000 of the 18,000 were standing heroically, willing to go to concentration camps, really living out their faith. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got about 3,000 that are 100% in for Hitler. Mm. But the key is in the middle, you got 12,000 basically saying, "Ah, you know what, we don't need to choose. We're going to stay right here in the safe religious middle, except... The safe religious middle, that sitting on the fence thinking you're being neutral, I always say over and over, the devil owns the fence. They believed mm. that they had this kind of religious uh, you know, carve out, that we could do nothing, that we could be neutral. We're not going to stand heroically against the Nazis the way Bonhoeffer and others do. We're just going to we're just stay here. You know, it's kind of like somebody saying, I'm not going to vote. You have chosen to allow evil uh, to have its way, but you're pretending you've got this religious objection and, and you can just be uh, somehow neutral. And and that to me is where many in the American church are today. And I'll say it is where there are many people who go to churches like that, where yeah. you're just effectively playing church on Sunday morning rather than saying, this is not the church, we are the church and we meet on Sunday morning, but then we go out, yes. the church goes out of the building and affects the culture and fights for God's purposes in every sphere, including politically, just as we did when we fought the slave trade, just as we did when we fought uh, for the abolition of slavery in this country, just as when we fought politically to end Roe v. Wade, that's part of the church's calling. And so I, in, in both books, I, I try to make that clear. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Let's go on to uh, what does it mean to, and I think you covered a lot of this, but what does it mean to live out your faith actively? Yeah. Well, again, this, is, this gets to the, the core of what, I th- what I'm calling sort of the American heresy, is this idea that we don't need to live our faith out in all spheres. We can talk about it, but the reality is it's like a hobby. It's something I do in the basement. It has no bearing on what I do when I leave the basement. That's the opposite of what our faith is supposed to be. Our faith is supposed to be lived out in every single sphere. And I think that we kind of make faith, as I say, it's like this part-time thing, but it's supposed to inform everything that we do. My, my faith is supposed to inform uh, my relationships. It's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to inform... M- m- what what I would do with my life professionally, everything is supposed to be informed by my faith. And I think that in America, we've been so blessed that we've gotten spoiled and complacent and we kind of act like, well, it's this private thing. And we're supposed to bring God's, um, God's view of things, the biblical view of things into every single sphere. And a big part of the way we can do that is politics. We have the gift of self-government where we can advocate for, uh, for the right kind of... Um, 
for, for people who are advocating God's policies or we can ourselves run for office. So there are many things. We'll continue that. I know we're going to a break. Speaking of Bonhoeffer, this next one kind of, I think a lot of people were thinking about this one. If Dietrich Bonhoeffer were alive today in 2024, what do you think he would say about the state of America? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's fair to say that, well, I say this, I think, literally in the first page of this new book, that we're in a spiritual war and that we are in the third existential crisis of our history. The first was the revolution, the second was the civil war, and the third is where we are now. And what we're fighting now is the forces of real wickedness. In other words, that forces that are that are deeply hostile to Christian faith. In other words, it's not like in the old days where, you know, Tip O'Neill is the, the face of the Democrats and we've got some differences on taxes and this and that. No, 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 no. We are now dealing with evil. I mean, we had the president of the United States uh, who is dramatically pro-abortion, um, who is dramatically pro-transgender. I mean, re really sick stuff. He declared Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, as some trans day of visibility. I thought to myself, I've never in my life seen such an open hostility to Christians. I've right. never never seen it before. And, and I think if you're a Christian, you need to understand that's what's happening right now, and you need to be awake to it. And yeah. Bonhoeffer was awake to it in Germany. He said that what's happening now in Germany, we need to fight. And many, many, many Christians said, no, 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 we think you're just being a hothead and take it easy and, you know, Hitler, he'll be around, but he'll leave and we'll move on. And no, Bonhoeffer could see that the Nazis were playing for keeps. They wanted to fundamentally transform Germany. Yeah. Just as uh, the, the atheist, Marxist, uh, globalist uh, forces... Uh, in the world and inside America. Now, they want to fundamentally transform America, and they're doing it to make us no longer the nation that our founders brought into being with 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 the Lord's help, to put it mildly. The Lord brought it into being. And it was once meant to be a city, a shining city on a hill, in the words of John Winthrop, and that it was supposed to be a beacon of liberty and a beacon, frankly, of Christian faith, so that people would look at this country and go, what do they have that we don't have? What are they doing that makes them flourish? Why is God blessing them? How come they can govern themselves? That's so beautiful. What, it, what is going on over there? I mean, Tocqueville came over here uh, in the 1820s to investigate because this didn't go that way in France. The French Revolution was a bloody, yeah. atheistic, uh, to some extent, demonic revolution. It did not go well. It was a bloodbath. So Tocqueville comes over here to say, what do they have? What is his conclusion? The churches, vibrant Christian faith, it was at the very heart of America. Yeah. Now, it wasn't, we weren't officially Christian because why would we need to be officially Christian? We would just need to be actually Christian. We don't need to be officially Christian. But it was kind of assumed by all the founders that we're going to be essentially Christian. And we have drifted so far away from that. And, and we are now um, being attacked by people that are not just on board, but they are openly hostile to God's values, to God's principles, to biblical values, and to Christians. And so you have things that we never dreamt of in our lifetime, the FBI being weaponized against pro-life people. Uh, you have children being taken away from their mother and father because the mother and father have a biblical view of sexuality, uh, of the human person, and they don't want to use their kids' quote-unquote pronouns. And in Indiana and other places, the, the kids are being taken away by the state. This is a level of wickedness, a, a level of evil we've never seen. And yeah. if the church doesn't recognize it and say, it is our job, God has called us to stand against this, yeah. God has called us to get in the fight, then it's, it's over. And yeah. so I, I'm, I'm afraid that that's kind of, that's, that's where we are in America. I, I, I see some, a, a simple example of that is this, you know, guy wearing a dress and he's got a beard and he says, my name's Michelle and I want you to call me Michelle. And if you call him Michelle and, and treat him as a woman, not only does he have a problem, you have a problem. Right. And then of course the nation has a problem. You've been forced to lie. Exactly. Yeah. We are self-censoring. We're yeah. afraid. You know, I, I think if if somebody said that to me and I went like this, <laughs> yeah. it would go to the Supreme Court. 
You're yeah. not allowed to do that yeah. because that's hate speech. Yeah. That's a hate <laughs> smirk. But I mean, honestly, that's where we are. Yeah. And that, that's, but the thing is, and again, the reason I wrote this, both of these books, but specifically this Religionless Christianity, is because there are many Christians who feel like they can opt out. They can avoid this. Like yeah. it's not going to come for them. One of the chapters of the book I talk about the spirit of cancel culture. Yeah, I it is, get it is a that. wicked yeah. Marxist spirit, yeah. and it's coming for you. Mm -hmm. And so you need to stand against it when it comes for anybody, not just when it comes for you. We'll talk about that later. But in the book, I talk about Bonhoeffer. I talk about Martin Niemöller. Yes. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of Bonhoeffer in this book. Are you optimistic about the future of America? And there's a part two, what should the church be doing right now? But yeah. let's go with part one. Yeah, Are the you church optimistic? should stop playing church and get, yeah. in the, get in the game. Stop being religionless. Stop being religious. Just uh, yeah, and be Stop being merely religious. Um, okay, well, um, am I optimistic about America? Um, it's hard to call that optimism. I am hopeful. Mm. I am, I am, um, at the end of the book, I say that, um, well, at the beginning of the book, I say we're in a third existential crisis. So I think of George Washington, I think of Lincoln, mm. If you had gone to Washington or to Lincoln in the depths of the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and said, how you doing? Yeah. They would have said, we are doing very, very poorly. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a horrible, horrible war we are in, and it doesn't look good. Yeah. If you had asked George Washington in 1776, how's it going? He would have said, it's going very, very poorly. It was going very poorly. It was, they were in a war. Um. But he also would have said, I think, um, we're in a war and it's going poorly, but if God be with us in this mm. cause of liberty, uh, we can prevail. Our job is to lean on the Lord as we fight on. We don't stop fighting until the Lord says it's over. Yeah. And there are many people who would have said, it's looking pretty bad, George. Why don't you just throw in the towel and he thought, I can't do that. I need to fight on. I need, this is, I've been called to, to bring a nation into being that where we will govern ourselves. It's an extraordinary concept. It's a beautiful concept. Uh, it's God's concept. And if the Lord wants to give us the victory, he can get us, he can give us the victory and pull us out of this difficult spot. So if you said to him, how are you doing? In 1776, he would have said, badly, mm -hmm. but we fight on and we fight on and we pray on and we pray on. If you don't fight because things look bad, you're guaranteed to lose, guaranteed. And that's exactly where I think we are today. Yeah. We're in a battle. It looks bad. But if the Lord be with us, yeah. then we can win. And who people who say no, that's the voice of the devil telling you to just give Throw in the towel. Yeah. Don't I, I, fight. I like the joke about the guy goes to the doctor. The doctor says, uh, you're in really bad shape. you got to take these pills. And he says, doctor, I'm a Christian. I believe that God is in charge and predestination and all that. So don't worry about me. I'm not taking any pills. And the doctor says, I'm also a Christian. And I believe that God's in charge. And here's the predestination part. If you take the pills, you're predestined to live. If you don't take the pills, you're predestined to die. Well, listen, folks, if you don't fight at all, you're going to die. We're going to die. It's, We're gonna, it, it, and which side do you want to be on at the end? Do you want to be on the side like the guys in the Alamo, you know, that, that fought on and fought on, but the victory was ultimately theirs because at some point, you know, God comes in and says, this is what we're going to, this is that's, what's going to happen. You know happen. what? That's exactly right. Would you rather be Bonhoeffer or would you be rather one of those people who through fear or, or some misunderstanding of the scripture sat and did nothing and really brought about the death of Bonhoeffer? Yeah. That's, that's what happens, right? If you don't fight with him, you're responsible for enabling his enemies to kill him, and you're responsible for the enemies of Germany to destroy Germany, and, which they did. And I'll tell you, one of the most beautiful scenes in your book, Bonhoeffer, is when he is going to his death. I had tears in my eyes, and he was going. He was like boldly going to his death because he was. He knew he was going to a better life. He knew he he stood against the evil of his day. And yeah, he would have. Oh my goodness, he would have loved to have lived. He would have loved to have gotten married. He would have loved to have a family and been a grandfather and a great grandfather. But he took a stand for future generations and for the generations in Germany that would that, hang their head in shame because they did not take. See, a stand. that's exactly that's it right there. Do you want to be like Bonhoeffer? 
then you, you, you fight for what is right and true, and you allow the Lord to be the one who determines the outcome. But your job is to fight. Your job is to stand for truth, to speak against evil, not to be silent in the face of evil. That's ultimately what I, what I hope to deal with um, in this book. Yeah, and here's a great chapter in this book I want to get to and get your thoughts on this, because, you know, we started out with um, politically correct, and it was kind of like funny. Ah, you're not politically correct. Ah. And then it became woke, and then it becomes cancel culture, where now it has a serious, serious charge yeah. to it. So what are your further thoughts? And it's from the book. Yeah. I do. There are two chapters in the book on cancel culture, and this is another one of the reasons I hope people will read the book Religionless Christianity, because you need to understand what is happening. What is cancel culture? It's not just something. What is it? It's, there's a spirit behind it. It's the same spirit, which is evil, uh, that was uh, happening during the French Revolution. Uh, it happened during the Bolshevik Revolution. It happened uh, in the in the Nazi uh, takeover of Germany. It happened in Mao's Cultural Revolution in China in the '60s. It is demonic, and it wants power, and it is bloodthirsty, and it's willing to pick off people. That's part of it, right? It has no actual standards. What it does, it pretends to care about the poor, pretends to care about racial equality. It pretends to get. It doesn't care about any of these things. All it's doing is using these things as a way to pick people off. And in the book, I talk about my friend, Kirk Cameron. He was on Piers Morgan. I tell the whole story in the book. And he was asked by Piers Morgan, you know, if he was in favor of same-sex marriage. And he said in the most kind way possible Mm. that he had a biblical view of marriage. He was attacked, 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 like he was the devil. And I thought, where were all the leading Christian voices to stand with him to fight back against these evil forces that had come. They wanted, you know, Kirk Cameron's head on a platter. It was not about Kirk Cameron. It's about when you put up a biblical standard, people are going to come after you. Yeah. They did not stand with him. Yeah. And the spirit of cancel culture wants to pick people off one at a time. I know we're going to a break here, uh, uh, but I, I just yeah. want to say that that is where it starts. So whenever somebody comes after anybody, you don't need to agree uh, with the person on everything. It's the principle. You need to stand against the spirit of cancel culture, which is demonic. You can call it what you want. We're, we're going to a break. Okay, so the book is Religionless Christianity. Folks, you can get it at ericmetaxas.com. We'll be right back. I want to ask you about chapter nine, but before we get there, uh, you, you, we were talking about Kirk Cameron and speaking the truth in love. I, in Ephesians, that's where you're going to find that, that phrase, speak the truth in love. But the verse right before it says something about there will be a day when there's all kind of deceptive truth out there, and you've got to be smart, and you've got to be wise about confronting it. So it's so funny. It sounds like it was written about today. A lot of deceptive truth, but you have have to confront it and speak the truth in love. Now, getting back to this, chapter nine in your book, this is very mysterious, this title, Bonhoeffer Burns His Boats, BBB. That's a, that's a principle. Uh, it happened in uh, Alexander the Great when he was attacking uh, Persia, the, the empire. He did this radical thing. Cortez also did this uh, in, the, in the early 16th century where you say, we're going to cut off our own escape route ah. because we are going to fight to the death. Ah. In other words, we're not going to allow ourselves a way out. If we're, we're going to force ourselves to fight with everything we have. And I think a lot of times that's what the church doesn't do. Like we kind of, we, we fight a little bit, but then it gets hot and we go, eh, we'll back off. You have to have the discernment to, to say, no, I'm going to go all in, and I'm going to lean on God. Without God, I lose. I need to lean on the Lord. I'm going to burn my boats so that I, I don't have an escape route. And Bonhoeffer does, does that a couple of times, but he does that most specifically in 1939 when he comes back to Germany. He was in America, yeah. and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be there for God's purposes. I'm not gonna I have an escape route. I'm in America, but I'm not gonna take it. I'm gonna go there, and I'm gonna lean on God. And I'm it's it's an amazing thing, but it's a principle. Yeah. And so I write about it in the book uh, that we need to understand what it means when God wants us all in. Yeah. Not just a little bit, but like this is. It's kind of like saying like, okay, folks. This is it. There's no tomorrow. Yeah. This is it. You, we have to fight with everything we have now. I think we're at that point in America now. That's why I say it's, it's an existential crisis. If we don't use everything we have now, 
we're guaranteed to lose. We, mm-hmm. we need to be, we need to use everything we have and we need every Christian. And I say this, you know, if the church is those of us who call in the name of Jesus, it's not the building that I go to, it's not the denomination, it's those of us who say we're Christians, we're the church. Well, you, Mr. or Mrs. Christian, um, you might be the tipping point. In yes. other words, you might be the one, if you go all in, that might be the tipping point into we will save the nation for God's purposes as a platform for the faith in the world, as a platform for freedom. It might be literally up to you. And when we say, what is the church? You're the church. Yeah, and and, and the truth is we were all born for such a time as this. So you got to step up, folks. You're either going to sit on the couch. I was watching a Yankee game the other day. I only watched a couple innings, and I said, I can't believe this. This is the way America used to be. You used to watch a baseball game, sit back, relax, enjoy yourself, and say, all is right with the world. And I thought to myself, but things are not all right right. with the world. It's okay. Yeah, you need some refreshment, but you got to get back into the fight. And by the way, if Sam Houston had come to the Alamo with reinforcements that they were hoping for, yeah. that would have been a different battle. And right. so we who are in the Alamo now right. are looking for reinforcements so we can... That's a beautiful way of putting it. I don't say it in the book. Now I wish I had. That's beautiful. 